I guess officially my specialization is quantitative media analysis. That's what it said on my um, website for, for, my, for my job at least. Mm. But you're right. Um, it goes a lot further than that. And actually I do do a lot of uh, qualitative research as well. And one of the reasons um, that I think it's important to do that is because the groups and the topics that I've been looking at, that I've been re researching for at least, well, at least a decade actually, um, they are often uh, vulnerable groups. People who come from disadvantaged backgrounds, people who come from backgrounds uh, where they have not had many opportunities, um, let alone digital opportunities, but they haven't really had many opportunities in life in general. And um, working with the, those people, actually some of the, the richness of the uh, the research and the data and the stuff that we look at really comes from an understanding of um, a more qualitative aspect about their everyday lives, doing interviews with them, t seeing how they live, what is the reality of their everyday lives. And um, I was here yesterday at the conference as well, and obviously I've gone to more conferences, and this thing always happens to me. Yesterday I sat in, in a lot of sessions, and there was all these amazing things that we can do with technology now. All these new developments, all these fantastic tools that we have. Uh, you know, there's nothing crazy enough for us not now to have some kind of technical solution. And when I sit through these presentations, I always think, oh my gosh, tomorrow I'm going to have to stand up there and kind of give a little bit more of a pessimistic or negative story, uh, bring, maybe bring myself and the people around me back to earth a little bit. That's not a very grateful task, but I think it's a very important task, because sometimes when we talk about technology and all the amazing things that we can do with it, we kind of forget that there are still a lot of people around us that are either, for whatever reason, financial, um, health, um, all kinds of other reasons, which is what I will talk about today, are not able to take up these opportunities. They can't access it, they don't have the skills, they don't know how, and they feel because of that, because this is a technological society, because this is a society in which information and uh, media such as the internet are so pervasive, they're so much embedded and ingrained in everything that we do, that those people that are not really able to effectively use them, they do come to feel excluded. And often this is a, a social sense of exclusion. It's not just, I'm not able to pay my bills, but it's a feeling of, I don't really, I can't really participate in this society. And in general, you know, what we, I, I'm assuming most of you as well, uh, as me, would hope is that we create societies in which people are able to participate at an equal footing, where they have equal opportunities at least to participate in all those things that make life worthwhile. So I guess that's a little bit of a context to my talk, because we talk a lot about technology, but we shouldn't forget that in the end, what we're worried about really is about the people and about their well-being and how they live their lives. So the story that I'm going to tell now is really a story of change. A story of change in terms of technology, um, what the internet is and what it means to use the internet has changed quite a lot over the years. Uh, it's a change in policy, it's the, a change in what governments and what stakeholders, what all kinds of organizations uh, think they should be doing to get people engaged with technologies. And it's also a story of change in terms of what we see um, people's relationship with technologies as. So what is it that in this context we consider digital inclusion? So I'll, I'll I kind of talk you through that and let me see if I can work this bit of technology. Wow, yes. Okay, I'm still, I'm still included up until this point. <laughs> okay, um, so let me first start a little bit with the changes in the way that we've looked at what digital inclusion actually is. And some of you might have already thought about or heard about this before, but there's been quite a significant change in only the last 10 years in terms of what we think we consider digital inclusion. So the, the starting point really, obviously, is just access to the technology. Without access to the technology, 
we can't do anything with it. Yeah? So this is a fundamental aspect of digital inclusion. Now, access is not just any access. Access is high quality access. It's broadband that we've been talked about before. It's um, ubiquitous. It's access that's everywhere, um, that you don't have to think about it to go somewhere to use the technology. It's just there for you. Yeah, it's kind of seamless experience. And this, everybody agrees, is, is important and has been part also of policy. Now, the second area of digital inclusion, which is almost as important in the way that, for example, the European Union, and I know your government as well, and um, in, the, in the UK, in England, where I'm doing a lot of my work, um, is focusing on, is this area of skills. And this is skills in relation to technology, obviously, so there's technical skills, just how to turn it on, how to click, how to use it, but it's also in terms of um, more traditional types of skills, literacies, as we call them, which is social and critical literacy. How do you know how to trust the source? How do you know uh, who to interact with online? What are the kind of things like etiquette? What kind of norms do we have for interacting? All these things, is things that we have to learn. And while the skills that we have, there might be something about doing them on a technology that makes that slightly more different and that makes us have to reconsider what it is that we have to learn to live in a society like this. Digital exclusion also is about motivation, because one of the things that we've noticed, and I'll show you a few um, statistics or data about that afterwards, is that even some people have access and they even have the skills, but they still don't really use the technology to its full benefit. Yeah? And often one of the things that we've noticed in the research that we've done is that this often has to do with some motivation issues. Uh, why people are not, you know, maybe people in general think that actually technologies are not a good thing for society, I'm not going to engage with that. Or they have personal motivations where they say this just doesn't work for me. Yeah? And it's not necessarily that much to do with skill. And this last bit, which we call engagement, which is really the types of uses that we can make of these technologies, is for me one of the most important things. Because what use are access and skills and a motivation to engage with technology, to use technology, when we don't really use it? <laughs> yeah? When we don't really do any of the things, any of the opportunities that are there. So, um, and, and the internet is growing, and this is why I'm saying this is a story of change. Yeah? What used to be inclusion, even five years ago, what used to be engagement five years ago, high-level engagement five years ago, now might actually be a very basic thing, or might not be that important anymore. Yeah? I don't think anybody would consider now that sending an email with an attachment yeah? or um, maybe even looking for information in, in a browser would classify somebody as very digitally included if they don't do anything else anymore. Yeah? So we need to look at that breadth, at the number of things that people do. I did promise I was going to talk about policy a little bit because policy reflects this change in the way that we thought about what people do with technology. And we can see that in most countries, and, and it's here as much as in the rest of Europe and in the UK, we've seen that most of these policies to kind of promote digital inclusion have started really from an infrastructure perspective, the pipes, putting in the lines. Yeah, very important, access, yeah? Can't do without that. In the UK, they've then started to realize, well, just having some kind of access somewhere is not enough, yeah? Really what is important, and, and especially in, in more uh, northern European countries, is what we see is that home access, which brings with it a freedom to play around. Um, people are less afraid of, of, of using the technology at home in their own safe space, um, has become important. So in the UK, we've had this program which is called the Home Access Plan, where they brought computers into the homes of uh, uh, families that had children in education. Very important. Not completely successful, by the way, but... Right, fair enough. They tried. Okay, then what we can see, and I'm obviously telling you this from a UK perspective, but this is reflected what we see in Europe and in other areas as well, is this idea of universal uh, service. Yeah, and in the UK it was called universal service uh, commitment, where the government and the policy started aiming at not only do we need to provide infrastructure and high quality infrastructure and a comfortable environment to engage with the technology, 
but actually we need to make sure that people are able to take up all the different services that we offer. And obviously when you're government policy, you know, you're most worried about the government services that you provide, but it's really about that. Now what we've seen more recently is kind of a split. It's kind of a shift, and this might have something to do with the economic crisis, where people are saying, like, actually, this universal service commitment is quite difficult. Yeah, There's a lot of stuff needs to be done for that. So we can see people policy going back more towards the infrastructure. Also with this idea that if we provide the infrastructure, society is now at a point that everybody will just start using the technology. So if we give people high quality access, then people start using the technology. In Europe, on the other hand, they also have that still, but on a European level, they're really worried about the skills aspect of it. So, but we can see a little bit of a move away from content provision or thinking about how we can get people to engage with a very broad range of activities. And this is kind of where we are now and where I think a lot of uh, countries are moving, which is this idea of digital by default. And this is um, a different story than saying, um, a universal service commitment where you commit to trying to provide the services to everybody else and that everybody has equal access to services, the digital by default strategy says, we, before anybody does anything else, and this is mostly in government, you have to make your thing digital. Yeah? It's digital by default and actually let's forget about the rest. Yeah? And the idea is, is that it's kind of a push. If we, if we push the digital on, then people will have to use it and people will start taking it up. Now, there's some, there might be some truth in that, and there is some, uh, some, some reason to believe that, that that is an aspect of uh, intervention or of policy. But as I will show you rapidly in the next few minutes, this might be a problem. This might not um, solve the problem that we have, that actually some people are really not able to engage at all, even if they have to. Um, in... Um, I can answer questions about that afterwards or if you want to come and talk to me. Under this digital by default strategy in the UK, there's two arms. One is what's called the Race Online Project, which is about getting people online, where they've, it's 1,500 organizations that have participated in this, where they're trying to get uh, normal people, ordinary people like you, like me, to get at least one other person online. They're called digital champions, yeah. Um, <clears throat> there's all kinds of problems with evaluating that because it, they haven't really thought beyond what getting online actually means. Yeah? And then the other aspect of this is really that super broadband infrastructure strategy, which um, people across Europe look to Sweden and they go, oh my gosh, if we could only live in that Valhalla. <laughs> We're not there yet, but they're trying hard to catch up. Yeah. Okay, so now, now it's statistics time. I said quantitative, you know, that's what I do. Um, so really, in, uh, actually in most of Europe now, the infrastructure bit is relatively okay. Obviously, in some rural areas, there's still problems. Um, even if we talk about the UK, there's still problems in, uh, in urban areas where connections are quite not as good. Um, but we can see, you know, we're do not doing too bad. We as in Northern Europe, yeah? So in, in the United Kingdom right now, 82% of people uses the internet. Now, everybody in the UK, actually has access, yeah? Somewhere. Maybe not at home, but they have access somewhere. Yeah? Norway, Sweden, above uh, 90%. Yeah? Lots of people. But still, that's not an insignificant number of people. 20, in, in the UK, 20% of people are not online, depending on which figures you use. In Sweden, it's some figures, it's 10%. It's one in every 10 um, of the population, okay? Now, how can we... So let's look a little bit at what was behind those figures that I showed you. Both what is behind that use figure and both what is behind that non-use figure. Who are these people and why are they not actually even using the internet beyond what they would do if they actually got online? So this is, this is obviously based on the UK data because after this we'll talk about the Swedish data. <laughs> but, um, so, and this is a pattern that we see replicated in most countries where the internet and technologies have become more and more widely available. So we can see that in 2005, um, you know, cost, access and skills were kind of their um, all prevalent, most important for people at that point, or the most mentioned reason for not using the internet was that they didn't have any skills. 
After that, they didn't have any access, and then came cost. And we can see this remained kind of constant, yeah? Um, cost has become slightly less important, but there's almost no change in that sense from 2005 to 2011. Now, the interesting story starts here. And this is about no interest. These are the people that they're saying that they're not using the technology because they're not interested. Yeah? It's not for them. Uh, why would I? It's no benefit to me. Half of the people who didn't use the internet in 2005 said that this was one of the reasons why they weren't using the technology. Now, look at what happens in 2011. 88% of people who are not online are, not, are saying that that is because they're actually not interested. So this means that we're talking about a different group of people now, yeah? This is a different type of non-user than we had in 2005. And they're different in two reasons, for two, in two ways. One is that their priorities have changed, yeah? It's also maybe because sociodemographically they're a little bit different now than they were in 2005. But another thing that has changed from 2005 to 2011 is that actually now if you ask somebody what are the reasons that you do not use the internet, they mention, well, I'm not interested, but actually I also don't have the skills and I don't have access. And if you ask me, it's also too expensive. In 2005, yeah, only six years ago, if you ask that same question, people would say, I'm not interested, full stop, or it's just too expensive, full stop. Yeah, they didn't have a wider variety of reasons. So when you talk about policy or interventions or you're interested in getting people online and to engage with the technology, you need to realize that now, we have a lot more barriers to overcome. And this is one of the things that the Race Online Project in the UK has been confronted with, that when they started doing these things uh, through what was uh, still called the UK Online Centres, in 2007, if you put a poster in the window of a cent uh, like a centre and you said, free internet, yeah, uh, come and take a computer class, people would come in. They're not having that anymore. They still have those posters up. People don't come in anymore. Why? Because the people who are not using the internet now are a different group of people. And so it's really difficult to figure out if we can learn from the past about what to do in the future. But there's some... Yeah. And this is something I've been working on recently, which is something that we discovered in, uh, is going on happening in the UK. Because one of the things that people often argue is that actually this digital inclusion thing, and this is why people focus on infrastructure, it's not really a problem because the people who are not online are kind of old. And one of the things that happens with old people is that they die. And they're going to die relatively soon. And then when they die, we don't have to worry about it anymore because there will be all these young people who are digital natives and they are just going to use the technology. Yeah? Now, this is a pro problematic, because what our research shows is that actually there is a persistent group of people who have what we call compound disadvantage, several types of disadvantage offline, that are consistently less likely to engage with the technology. Not only are they less likely to engage, but they're also, their increase in engagement or in access, which is what is shown here, is a lot lower and slower than that of the other groups. And in the UK, we, we know that this persistent group, what we've called the digital underclass, is those people with low education who are unemployed. And this is a graph that is the same if you take people under 50, yeah? This does not change. So, and we've projected this, and if the internet would not change, if connections would not change, yeah? This is about whether they have broadband access at home. If everything else would stay the same, unlikely, if everybody, everything else would stay the same, then those people who have lower education and are unemployed would take about 20 years to catch up with that group of people who are, have low education and have a job. Yeah? That is if everything would stay the same and catch up with the level they are now, not catch up with you know, being exactly the same. Few more graphs just to kind of stress this point. That was where you could see that the relative 
this, uh, the relative disadvantage or the relative exclusion was getting bigger because the distance between these groups was getting bigger and bigger and bigger. In this graph, we can say that this is very consistent. This is about the skills that people say they have. Yeah? Again, that group of lower educated unemployed people, if you look from 2003 to 2009, there's almost no increase in how confident they feel in using technology. And these are people who use the internet. Yeah? So in that group, there's something that needs to be done. If you, if you just provide access, or if you just get people online, that doesn't automatically mean that they're going to increase their skills. It's what we can see here. Something else needs to be done. Now, and this is important when we talk about policy or interventions, because one of the other things that we show, and this is how many things that people do online, the breadth of their use, how, how many different activities they do, is that we see that same group, yes, they have increased their engagement, it's become broader, but it's still relatively the same distance from that higher group. Yeah, and this means that and when you look in more detail at what's going on there, what you can see is that actually that group who rely most on services, who rely most on the charity sector, who rely most on government, the thing when, even when they are online, the thing that they are most li least likely to do, sorry, is to actually engage with those activities. Yeah? So we get people online, we train them in skills, they start using the technology, and then they don't do the things which maybe, you know, we thought might be most useful for them, which is kind of problematic. And because this is also the hidden cost of a policy that is digital by default. Because you have your services online, but if these people are not getting to them, you can't as a society say, oh, well, you know, who cares if they go on the benefits? They're online, they're playing games, they're Skyping, they're on Facebook. That's not really an option, I think, as a society. So this is really where we need to think about how can we deal with that. Two asides, and this is, then it's where I'll stop. <clears throat> this is two things, this and the next slide, that we need to keep in mind. One is what it really means when people say they're not using the internet. Yeah? One, of the, one of the things that we've realized in our research is that of those people who don't use the internet, one in three of them in both in the UK and in uh, Chile, which is where I also did this research, is that uh, one in three of them actually has somebody who can do this for them. Yeah? So for now, if we're really interested in getting access to services, if that's what we're interested in, what we might think about now is this idea of proxy users or intermediaries. Yeah? C who are these people that are using the internet for other people? Maybe, and this is what we're looking at with the health service in the UK at the moment, maybe we should build our websites not for our clients, not for the people who are unhealthy, but for the people who are looking for information or uh, services or other things for the people that have that disadvantage. Yeah? And that is kind of a switch. Obviously, this is not a solution forever. Yeah? We don't want, because the quality of the information that you get through a proxy user is often a lot lower than when you get it directly yourself. And then this is where the second aside, where I think, we, what we really should not lose track of. In the end, yes, we want people to engage digitally with the technologies, but what we really need to understand is how that can lead to cultural, economic, social, and individual well-being. That's what it's about. And to create interventions that work, and that actually get people engaged and using the technologies in a lot of different ways, we need to understand the bit that's on the left here, yeah, is it on the left for you as well? Yeah, for you it's on the left, for me it's on the right. Yeah. We need to really understand the people that we're working with. If you are a stakeholder working with a certain group, you need to understand what is going on there, because the engagement is what's going to happen, what's going to drive impact. And this is actually, sadly, where we know the least. How we can get use of technology to actually make people's lives better. This is where we have the least information. So this is a conclusion. If we have a, just a push, which is a digital by default strategy, put it out there, and then people will use, this is what is likely to happen, yeah? If we have a pull strategy, where we look at what are people's needs, and where, how are they, what are their disadvantages and, uh, and, and advantages and opportunities offline, yeah, their traditional indicators, and base our interventions and policy programs on that, by looking at skills and motivation and on 
um, you know, how can we integrate technologies into things that people are already doing, then this is more likely to happen. Yeah? That's the pool strategy where you look at the people that are there and you get from them to figure out what they need, and that's it. That's a lot more difficult, by the way, than digital by default, and I'll stop with that. What you just said gave us much to think about in mm. our campaign. I think it's extremely important uh, as a message uh, which we have to really digest in the coming, <laughs> yeah. coming time. Uh, would there be any questions for Ellen just for now? Otherwise, we're uh, sh running out, out of, of time. time. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I went on but for that's too long. Not, that's <laughs> not your fault, <laughs> yeah. Ellen. Uh, thank you very, very much. And I think we have to go on in the, in the program. Uh, I would only just may, uh, maybe again ask you to comment on the issue of uh, push and pull. Now, what would be a pull strategy? What would you say is, uh, if you look at uh, Great Britain, how, how do you go about that? Do, do uh, Race Online address that issue? Well, this is one of the problems that Race Online has been having, because they haven't really um, created any indicators or any guidelines on terms of what people actually should be engaging Indeed. with okay. with the technology. So this is one of the things that um, there's now kind of people are reflecting on that. So it's really understanding better what are the different opportunities that technology offers and mapping that onto the disadvantages and the opportunities that people have already in their everyday lives. And actually one of the things that they're now coming back to, although it's difficult, is to kind of think about how can we integrate these digital inclusion strategies, again, in more general social policy, because they've been going apart and yes, it's realized yes. this is not working. We need to bring them back mm -hmm. together again and match digital inclusion policy to social well-being and inclusion policies. And, and when you do that, that might have a, a, a greater impact in oh, that yeah, area. Great. Yeah. Uh, it seems as if much of the development of these services for the moment uh, or have more of a production uh, point of departure rather than mm. a demand point of departure. Yeah, exactly. So and you have to integrate that with other policies. Thank you, thank, thank you, you very much, Ellen. Yeah. Great having you here.